If you'd open your Bibles with me to John chapter 20. Uh, John chapter 20. This is the fifth week of our Hope series and the last week of that Hope series. And uh, as we were talking about it and planning for it, I, I ran across this scripture and I said, oh, this needs to be after Easter, one of the last ones. It's one of my favorite passages that brings the most comfort to us. Peace I give you. Anybody want peace today? Yeah, the world's seeking it, aren't they? Um, heard a story one time about a crowded airliner that was about to take off. And peace that is sometimes nice when you have to fly was shattered by a five-year-old boy who picked this moment in time to throw a temper tantrum. I know none of you have never been through that. No matter how and what his mom could do, the embarrassed mother tried to calm him down. The boy just kept going, screaming, kicking the seats around him. Suddenly, from the rear of the airplane, an elderly man in a uniform of an Air Force general was seen walking slowly up the aisle, stopping the flustered mother with a, as she was correcting her child. The white-haired gentleman, soft-spoken, leans down, motions towards his chest, whispers something in the boy's ear, and instantly... The boy calms down, gently takes the mother's hand and quietly fastens the little boy's seatbelt. Um, there was peace again. Instantly, the crowd was quiet, of course. All the people on the airplane. What in the world just happened? The general makes his way slowly back to his seat. One of the cabin attendants gently touched his sleeve and says, Excuse me, general. Uh, she said, do you mind if I ask you what magic words you might have used to calm that little boy down? The old man smiled serenely and gently. He just said, well, I showed him my pilot's wings and my service stars and my battle ribbons and explained that they entitled me to throw one passenger out of the door <laughs> on any flight that I choose. Peace. Uh, I, I told this, uh, I was uh, with some friends last night, and I don't know why it popped in my head, and it's, it's back in there again today. But did you know that, you, you probably didn't know this, but uh, there's immense peace in India. Didn't hear about it? Because rarely anybody has beef there. So that wouldn't have won the dad joke contest? <laughs> okay. All right. Well, everybody's wanting peace. Look around us. I've also was thinking, have you ever noticed that certain people possess maybe an extra amount of charisma and charm and allure sometimes in this life? And we've seen it through our history. Their presence makes a room come alive. Their pull their energy. They have something that's special that causes people around them to stop and listen. Uh, the men and women in history that have served with Generals Patton and MacArthur would tell you stories about both of these men. They, pet, they possess something special. When they walked into a room, the whole atmosphere of the room was changed. You knew someone important was present. People waited and stopped to listen. There have been others through our history who have commanded that kind of attention. Some of our presidents from our past have possessed magnetic personalities. And other people in, in media and maybe even sports stars, they have this magnetic personality that draws people towards them. However, this morning, the passage that we're going to read, we're going to read about Someone who had more charisma, more of that something special than anybody that I've ever mentioned all put together. No one 
like our Lord Jesus and Savior, was able to command the attention of thousands of men and women and children for hours and days at a time. What we're going to read this morning from John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. You listen as we read that this morning. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and side. They were filled with joy as he saw the Lord again. And again he said, peace be with you. It must be pretty important if he repeated it, you think? As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. And they told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked. Suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them and said, Peace be with you. For the third time. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound of my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord, my God, Thomas explained. And then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. What we just read is one of those... Electric passages you could only find in the Word of God. You want to be challenged? Read through the Gospels, my friend. See the many miracles that were done. Here, this story deals with one of those times when Jesus' mere presence in the room transformed everything. Instantly, with His presence, things went from negative to positive. With Jesus in the room, there came courage and faith where there was once fear and doubt. With Jesus in the room, there was laughter and joy where there once been sorrow and despair. And what Jesus was able to do in that room so long ago, listen church, I believe he wants to do in our lives and in the church every day, weekly. I believe when we invite Jesus to be present among us, We will experience seasons of joy and peace, transformation, salvation, courage, faith in amazing ways that the world will not know what to do with. Ways that change not only the atmosphere of our worship setting, but changes the way that we live and the way we work as well. So what exactly in this passage can we see Jesus doing? What can his presence to a room of people do? Especially people that needed courage, needed direction, need faith. And we see that Jesus' presence casts out all fear and ushers in a state of peace and harmony. We we read the story here. The disciples are gathered in that room. They had every right to be terrified. The Romans had just crucified their rabbi, their leader, their teacher, uh, as far as they knew, they could be the next ones nailed to a cross. And instead of being just three crosses, there could have been 11 more. No doubt that was part of their thoughts. And I'm, I'm, I, I think if you were in that room, you could smell the anxiety, the fear, With Jesus dead, it wouldn't take long for the Sadducees and Pharisees to gather up his remaining followers. In no time, Jesus' teachings and influence would simply fade away. 
Sure, there would be some that try to hold on, but as these disciples are gathered that day, as they're, they likely were thinking, yeah, we need to be obedient to his teachings, but with all these threats and pressure, not many are going to hang on. The Jesus movement would soon be dead. Jesus, after all, had been found guilty of treason and blasphemy, at least by the religious leaders. By following him, the disciples, they would be labeled the same. How long, the question might be, how long could they hide out in Jerusalem before it was safe to go back to Galilee? Would they ever be able to go back to Galilee? What could they do now? Likely, they're in that room, they're afraid. They've given up everything to follow Jesus. What if someone found them hiding? Were the Romans coming to arrest them? Question after question that invokes fear for anyone. It's no doubt they were afraid. Jesus told them to pick up their cross and follow him. Did they really understand that? Is this what he's talking about? We've got to follow you to the cross? Hmm. It's coming about what he talked about. Now they're huddled huddled together, afraid, behind closed doors that look very much like doom. But then it happened. Gloriously it happened. Suddenly in the middle of their anxiety and angst, Jesus appears. Not even a locked door could keep him out. Not even a room filled with fear and doubt and despair could keep him out. Jesus was there. Jesus is here, and he's bringing hope and peace. For that's what Jesus does with our fear, with our anxieties, with our despair. Uh, when Jesus comes to our midst, they, I, into, into their midst there in that room, they all begin to change. Their attitudes begin to change. The fear was wiped away. We all love such stories uh, that compose and give us the history of some of the songs that we sing. Uh, You may have heard this story before, but it fits so well, and I'm going to repeat it here in this message this morning. Many of you might have heard of the name Horatio Spafford. He wrote a song which we're going to sing at the end of the service today. It is well with my soul. That song was always meaningful, but then when I got old enough to read and realize what the backstory was, it it changed my view of the song. In the late 1860s, Horatio's family was climbing up the social ladder in Chicago through hard work. Uh, They were now among the social elite Horatio was a successful lawyer and businessman, uh, looking on the outside, looking in at their family. He had fame and fortune were on their doorstep. Then came the great Chicago fire of 1871. Horatio's growing empire seemingly devastated. Much of his real estate had been engulfed in flames, but the young lawyer was not defeated. He immediately set about remark, remaking his fortunes, rebuilding this kingdom, so to speak, and things were going well. In 1873, he was smacked again, this time with a sudden economic downturn, first a fire and then a recession. The future didn't look good for him and his family, but the family had already planned a European vacation, a trip for some time, a getaway for the family. However, with Horatio's business, there was some pressing zoning concerns that he needed to take care of. So he sent his family, his wife and four girls ahead of him while he could take care of this business. And his hope was that he would soon catch up with them in a week or so on another ship. And they would all enjoy some time of rest and relaxation together. Tragically, that reunion never occurred. The boat carrying his family was broadsided by another ship, resulting in the death of 226 passengers and crew aboard the ship Horatio's wife and four daughters were on. 
All four of his daughters were lost at sea. Only his heartbroken wife, Anna, survived. As soon as possible, she sent word of what happened to her husband. Horatio immediately boarded a boat to be with his grieving wife. She needed him more than the business needed him. Both of their hearts were broken. First there's a fire, then a recession, now death. Seems their life was in shambles. On the voyage to France, Horatio asked the ship's captain to inform him when they would pass by the area where the incident, the accident had occurred and where he lost his family. He wanted to take a moment to honor his four girls. Maybe he was seeking a connection, a moment of connection as well as closure, full of anxiety, broken hearted, full of despair. And then he says this in his memoirs. But then Jesus came over my soul. There I was looking in the waters, he said, where my daughters had plunged to their deaths. And Horatio was inspired to write the song, It Is Well With My Soul, over the same waters that covered the watery graves. Jesus began to fill his heart with peace and with hope. Horatio knew that God had not abandoned him, but that God was right there with him. Horatio knew that God would be with him and Anna, no matter what their future would hold. History goes on to tell us that Horatio and his wife had other children, and with God's help, they began to rebuild their lives. In later years, they founded what is was known as as the American colony in Jerusalem. It was there they constructed and partnered with soup kitchens, hospitals, and orphanage. And God had taken their fear, their sorrow, and had given them peace. God had given them a new place to pour out their lives, not among the elite in Chicago, but among the poor and needy in Jerusalem. For the disciples in our story in John 20, for the Spaffords, For many others, there's a common underlying theme, and it's that of Jesus. All of them found themselves alone, maybe afraid, fearing the future. And honestly, there's nothing wrong with fear. At times, it is healthy for us. But unchecked, fear will try to dominate our lives, and Satan will use that fear to destroy us. He tried to do that with the disciples. I believe he tried to do that with the Spaffords, the author of it as well. And here's what I want you to catch. If we allow it, he will try to do it to us in our darkest moments, our most difficult moments. When you find yourself afraid and you look around, call on Jesus to be in your midst. He will come and bring you peace. He will come and take away despair and replace it with courage. As I read through this passage, peace is not the only gift. Also, his presence ushered in that day. For we see in verse 20, his presence brought joy. That's what the world needs to see. Yes, they need to see peace in the midst of a storm. They need to see that we have hope. They need to see that we have joy. Joy is such a wonderful thing, and yet too many people, it is evasive. These disciples learned that true joy is relational in nature. That is to say, true, lasting joy happens between people. But they were overcome, the disciples were overcome with joy when Jesus arrived in their midst. And this hit me. More than anything, they wanted to be with Jesus. How about us? More than anything, you want to be with Jesus? Folks, our our society promotes that true, true joy can be found in things, in possessions. All you have to have is, uh, is to get a new car or watch commercials. Good grief. It sounds like if you just get the right watch, drive the right car, wear the right clothes, it's going to be euphoric for the rest of your life. 
Somehow that this idea, if you own this item, you'll suddenly be overwhelmed with great lasting joy and happiness. Yet history is littered with stories that deny that. Joy lasts about as long as the shine does on any new toy. In a matter of days, people again are overwhelmed with a sense of loneliness and despair. Why? Because the shine wears off and the payments keep on coming. Right? So the disciples rejoiced that day. Peace and joy filled that little house because Jesus was in their midst. Joy replaced fear and sorrow because Jesus was there. Joy and laughter and celebration filled the air. Uh, I tell you, more than once in my life, many, many times, I have praised the Lord because there's a spirit of joy and laughter and celebration in the church. That's the way it should be. In the church, there should be peace and joy. In the world, there's sorrow and pain and despair. Why? Because they're without Jesus. Without Jesus, the church would be another social club. Without Jesus, these disciples were full of gloom and heartache and despair. Without Jesus, they could only hide and lock their doors. But with Jesus, there is joy. There was joy. There's a spirit of enjoyment that is in the atmosphere. And finally, in that passage there in John 20, I get down to verses 21 through 24, where Jesus breathes on them the Holy Spirit. Folks, the Holy Spirit is necessary. We can't live a life, a Christian life, without the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. Peace I give you. As the Father sent me, I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they will not be forgiven. Wow. See, Jesus brought to them just... So much more than a momentary state of peace and joy. Because Jesus understood that the disciples needed more than just a good Lord's day. They needed more than just Holy Ghost goosebumps. Whatever that is. I've heard people say that. I I just need those Holy Ghost goosebumps. I'm thinking, sounds like you need to put a coat on. But no. (laughs) Everybody's different. But they needed the Spirit to breathe into them. What do you think we need? We too. Father, allow the Holy Spirit to surround us, work through us, indwell us, and move us. Why? Jesus was setting the disciples up so they would go. They couldn't have done it without the Holy Spirit. We can't go without the Holy Spirit. We need the empowering of the Holy Spirit if we're going to be what God is calling us to be as a church. Otherwise, we're just doing some good deeds. So Jesus breathed on them as Holy Spirit. He filled them to receive and enjoy and experience. New life. Plus new power, plus new presence, meant turning the world upside down. And yeah, did they all have to bear their cross? They sure did. History tells us they were all martyred with the exception of possibly John. We don't know how he died, probably of old age on the Isle of Patmos. But he suffered. Read the scripture. He was boiled in oil one time. They tried to kill him. What's our cross? I don't know what the world has in mind for us. But I know we live in a dark place. Where there's temptations and struggle and heartache and hardship. And lostness all around. And people that are living their life. And don't have peace. And we got the answer. It's found in Jesus. 
What are we going to do? Uh, we no longer live without the Spirit's power. Individually, corporately, filled with His breath, with His Spirit. We are called to be change agents. Everybody does it differently in their setting, in their place, and where God's planted them. Your workplaces are different. The people you come in contact with are different. What are we going to do? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the joy we have in you. Challenge us, Father, to be not only just filled, but willing goers and doers of the word. Thank you that we can sing about the peace that you bring us. It's because of the cross of Jesus. It's because of the resurrection. You overcame death. and We have hope. Hope for ourselves, but hope to share for eternity. For a lost world. In Christ's name, amen.